Good evening. It is officially 7 o'clock East Coast time, and I want to welcome you to tonight's web seminar. It's titled Modern Art Comes to America, the Armory Show of 1913. My name is Andy Mink, and I'm the Vice President of Education for the National Humanities Center. Um, I'm joining you tonight actually from a hotel room in Washington, D.C., and I say that uh, really just to illustrate how how uh, much of a mar marvel it really is that we can assemble so many educators from all, all corners of the country to come together tonight to work with Marshall Price on this compelling content. Uh, joining me tonight is Libby Taylor, who um, works with me at the, at the center uh, located down in Durham, North Carolina, and she's very capably responsible for all the behind the scenes support of this American in the Class webinars. Um, every single time we host one of these, Libby works very closely with each scholar to develop the corresponding PowerPoint to learn to navigate the technology and to archive this work so that it's accessible and useful to you, our audience. Uh, she will be available to talk tonight um, or if you email her after tonight's session to see if you're ever interested in developing a more closely aligned working relationship with your department or your school or your district or your community. And every time we, we have a webinar, Libby forwards me the roster of registered participants and I always scan the list to see who I might recognize or make some small nod towards the geographic diversity of our network. Um, oftentimes I wonder what would be intriguing about a session like this for any one of you to sign up after a, a very long and, um, and, and hard day in the classroom. And it may be that you're here to uh, work directly with a scholar to learn from Marshall Price, his insights into art history and in this collection in particular. And if that's the case, I hope you will learn something tonight about the complex layers of art history. Or it may be that you're here to uh, figure out ways to take these same topics or the same process and stand in front of students tomorrow morning and somehow um, unpack that with them and, and give them some sort of practice and vocabulary on how to do that. It may also be that you're here to meet other like-minded educators. And you know, we have uh, usually 75, 80, 100, 125 teachers who register and then uh, a large number who are able to join us. They're grappling with exactly the same interests as you and, and, and issues. And I hope you find some time tonight to scan the chat box and see who else is with us. Um, as I'm introducing tonight's session, I'd also encourage you to use that chat box to introduce yourself, uh, describe where you're from, make some connections if you like. But ultimately, I hope you're here at this webinar for really all of these reasons. And I think the National Humanities Center in general really attempts to be a hub where the, the scholarship, the pedagogy, and the technology all come together to effectively impact and affect and advance the conversation of uh, humanities education. Um, as you may know, the Humanities Center is a place of fellowship. Um, every year we have 40 university professors who come and move themselves and their families oftentimes to North Carolina, and they show up every single day at our center, and they go to their study, and they do advanced research. They really think through uh, the understanding of humanistic uh, work and inquiry. And it's from that work that our education um, department um, often takes its inspiration. Not only do we want to develop advocacy, but we want to develop that, that innovation through content. We want, to, we want to mirror that rigorous process to think of ways to invite younger students to do very much the same sorts of things. Every single one of our fellows, when we, we pry their, their room key out of their hands uh, in May, have seem to have and claim to have a transformative experience. Uh, and in some cases, that might be relief from finishing their book or their digital project. In other cases, it's, it's truly being a sense of that community. And what we hope is that our work with educators and teachers like yourselves uh, can accomplish uh, very much the same sorts of things. We do that in a variety of ways. We do develop materials and resources that we hope you find relevant and useful. Um, if you go to AmericanTheClass.org, uh, our lesson resources are thoroughly vetted and reviewed by scholars. They are there for free and open for you to download and to use any way that you see fit. We'd always love to hear from you and how you purpose those for your classroom and how you differentiate with the students you work with. But we hope that that's um, a long uh, and deep repository of the kind of work that we do. These webinars are also, a, a, in my, my view, a, a really fantastic way to connect you in conversation with scholars. And we would encourage you to sign up not just for uh, the upcoming webinars for our spring series, but keep in mind um, the kinds of topics and the kinds of um, the kinds of work that you'd like to do. Uh, in particular, look at our webinar page in the coming weeks. We will be adding three new webinars for the month of May, and we're doing this in somewhat of an experimental way. We we are starting to play around with the notion of how these webinars are constructed. 
Uh, that includes the technology that we use. This is Adobe Connect, but there are many other platforms that uh, we're considering that might be more interactive and might be more media friendly. Um, and we would love to have you join us uh, for, for those to give us feedback on, on how those sessions uh, work and how they fit together. Uh, we're constantly inviting and really taking seriously the feedback that we get from teachers. Our Teachers Advisory Council is a 12-member team that literally spans from Alaska to Florida, and we are asking them on a regular basis to give us their feedback and their contributions to the work that we do. Uh, later this spring, we'll be soliciting uh, applications for the 2017-18 Teacher Advisory Council, and I would invite all of you to, uh, to consider at least and, and to think about ways that you might work with the center. One of those ways will be our Humanities Moments campaign. Uh, HumanitiesMoments.com is a, a, an online archive of solicited and, and vetted and curated moments in which stakeholders of all ages and all backgrounds from uh, Ken Burns to a high school student in Greensboro, North Carolina, has been able to articulate a moment in which the humanities as a discipline, a piece of literature, a piece of art, a primary source document, uh, an experience in a museum, um, has somehow impacted how they see their world, how they make connections with that world, and how they see their role as a citizen in that world. And this is a, uh, a free site to submit. Uh, we are developing a classroom model that we would invite each of you to consider doing with your own schools and your own students. But tonight really is about uh, the Armory Show, and I'm going to spend just a moment or two um, reminding you of the navigation of tonight's webinar and then ask Marshall to lead us through this very compelling topic. Uh, the course homepage that all of you used to sign up for is, uh, is still yours to have access. Uh, you will be able to get the PowerPoint that's associated with tonight's webinar and any corresponding resources that will be listed there. There will also be an evaluation at the end of this webinar that will allow you to download your certification. And we very much want you to, to make sure you do that so you can have documentation to take to your, your school or your administrator or your own teaching portfolio. Um, it's important to us to make sure that we know you're here. So if you've signed in with just your first name, uh, you might be able to edit that to include your last. But uh, Libby will be taking attendance and make sure that you get credit for being here. This webinar is really pretty straightforward. And it is an audio and, and chat-based format. Uh, in a moment when Marshall begins, he'll have a PowerPoint that he'll talk us through and, and sort of work with uh, in terms of, of um, unpacking the, these pieces of art and the collection and the history of that collection. My role will be to, to, um, to riff with Marshall and to ask questions that you might put in the chat box in the lower right-hand corner. Um, there'll be times where he will be speaking and, and lecturing in the seminar style, but I would always encourage you to chat out your questions or your thoughts or resources. Please don't wait for an invitation or wait for a pause. This could be an ongoing and real-time uh, event. And then again, that chat will be yours to, to archive and look through later on. Finally, you, you know, the truth is we've got uh, nearly 40, 45 folks with us tonight. We've got a nice community of of educators who will be thinking through these topics, but we also have behind all of us a very rich and deep social media network. I would highly encourage you to share this work and anything that you may hear with your whole background, professional and your personal uh, network. Um, there's some Twitter handles there that I'd encourage you to use, but um, don't hesitate to take this work and, and share it with others who may not have been able to join us. So again, I want to thank you for being here. Um, this will be a a very provocative uh, little over hour, hour and 15 minutes. And um, with that, I'd like to, to invite Marshall Price, who's the Nancy Hanks Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Nasher Museum in, in Duke, to take over the controls as presenter and, and tell us about the, uh, the Armory Show. Hi, Marshall. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Andy. Thank you so much. Um, am I getting through? Can everyone hear me? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, great, great, great. So uh, welcome. Um, it's my pleasure to be talking about the Armory Show of 1913 this evening. Um, as Andy mentioned, if you all have any questions along the way, uh, please feel free to uh, type them. Uh, Andy, I'm going to try to keep an eye on the chat box in the lower right, but um, if I miss something, Andy will uh, alert me to it and uh, get in that artist's and, zone marshall and i'll i'll find a way to pepper your <laughs> questions when the time is right okay great so um you know the the armory show of 1913 holds a kind of mythic 
place uh, within the history of American art and the development of modern art here in the United States. So I'm going to walk us through the sort of story of the Armory Show. Uh, I'll look at the, um, the genesis of the Armory Show, its precursors, the genesis, uh, the development, the show itself, and then uh, conclude really with a little bit uh, about the legacy of the Armory Show uh, as well. But to really understand the Armory Show and why it was so important in the development of art in the United States, uh, we really have to step back chronologically and look at what preceded uh, the Armory Show and consider some of the precursors leading up to it. So really in the United States, uh, in the early part of the 19th century, uh, there, the country lacked the, uh, the arts organizations that Europe had. Uh, there was no Académie des Beaux-Arts, there was no Royal Academy. Um, but in, in the, in the mid-1820s, uh, the National Academy of Design was founded to really uh, fill that role in this country. Uh, it was and still is, uh, it's still a living institution, still going on today, one of the longest arts organizations, uh, the oldest arts organizations in the, in the country. Um, and it was founded uh, by artists, uh, primarily uh, Samuel F. B. Morse, the inventor of the telegraph and Morse code. Uh, Morse was in the second and third quarters of the 19th century, one of the premier portrait painters in the country. And here's his portrait of the Marquis de Lafayette from 1825. Um, Morse, this was before he got into science. He, he was really a leading artist of the country. And Morse had been trained in, in England and felt that you know, the, the burgeoning republic really uh, necessitated uh, an arts organization uh, of the same sort of level that England had and France had. So he and several other artists got together and formed the National Academy of Design. It was a three-part organization, essentially. It was an honorary association of artists and architects, uh, in which artists and architects uh, were and still are elected into membership every year. Um, it was an art school. It was one of the earliest art schools in the country, and it is still uh, very active today. Um, and thirdly, and probably most important uh, for our purposes tonight, is that the National Academy of Design was uh, a venue for exhibition of contemporary American art. Uh, these exhibitions were, um, in many ways, um, uh, the sort of taste-making uh, events in this country. Uh, this is a, another painting by Morse from the 1830s, uh, very much uh, taken on a, a kind of European tradition, and it depicts the Gallery of the Louvre uh, in Paris. Um, and some of those paintings on the wall are identifiable and have been identified. But the Academy, so the Academy establishes an annual exhibition of contemporary art, again, one that um, until just recently it was, it was still going on, uh, one of the longest recurring exhibitions of art in the uh, country, if not the world. And it was uh, not only a place to see uh, a range of contemporary American art, uh, but it was also very much, as you can probably gather from looking at this illustration here, uh, very much a social event as well. This is another illustration of one of the Academy's annuals from 1882 uh, that was reproduced in, in Harper's, uh, Harper's Weekly. Now, the formation of the annuals really happens through uh, the selection of a jury. And um, as you can see from this picture of the annual jury from 1940, uh, it tended to be a fairly homogeneous uh, type of um, a group. Um, and over time, uh, throughout the 19th century, uh, the, the institution 
sort of began to become increasingly conservative in its tastes, let's say, uh, to the point at which uh, it became quite insular um, and uh, very much kind of only um, admitting or showing its own sort of uh, their own peers, very resistant to um, outside uh, influences and progressive works uh, in any sense of the term. So in 1907, this, this actually came to a bit of a head with a group called the Eight. Um, Robert Henry, who you see here in this slide, uh, was a very well-known illustrator and uh, art educator uh, from uh, uh, Philadelphia and New York. And he had a whole series of younger followers uh, of his who really came out of the newspaper illustration tradition. So much different than uh, artists who had uh, worked and shown in the hallowed halls of the National Academy. In 1907 at the Academy's annual, uh, Henry actually served on the jury. Um, several of his friends' work came before the jury and uh, Henry was outnumbered and many of those works were rejected by the Academy's jury. In response to that, uh, Henry and seven other artists gathered together and uh, presented their own exhibition the following year in 1908 at the Macbeth Galleries, one of the few commercial galleries at that time in New York City. And it was uh, in many ways a somewhat modest exhibition compared to the annual of the National Academy of Design, but it signaled uh, something very important uh, moving forward in terms of uh, the art establishment in this country. And it was really the first time that an independent exhibition had been formed outside of this sort of sanctioned uh, body uh, known as the National Academy. There were works by uh, John Sloan. And, and one of the things that, that really sort of, um, I think, uh, separated this group for the most part is that they were, uh, instead of, of primarily being interested in um, uh, sort of uh, landscapes, picturesque landscapes, they turned their attention to um, everyday scenes of city streets, the, the gritty streets of, of New York um, and, and other uh, cities, primarily New York, however. And you can see that here in, in John Sloan's painting, The Haymarket from 1907. William Glacken's Battery Park, uh, park at the lower end of, of Manhattan, 1902 to 1904. Uh, Robert Henry, Snow in New York. Um, and Ernest Lawson's uh, Spring Night, Harlem River. Everett Shin, George Lukes, Maurice Prendergast, somewhat of a sort of stylistic outlier within the eight, as you can see, a much more chromatic palette, um, still a, a, a city scene, although uh, albeit a, a kind of a halcyon one of, of Central Park. And Arthur B. Davies, uh, certainly, again, uh, somebody who uh, falls outside of the kind of typical subject matter uh, that the eight were known for, um, uh, primarily depicting these sort of fantastical landscapes with figures in them. The group also became known by the moniker of the Ashcan School, and that was primarily because uh, one critic uh, at some point along the way referred to their palette as resembling that uh, of an ash can. This is a wonderful illustration uh, from the World Magazine that I found. Um, and it just gives you a sense of how uh, rebellious this actually was at the time. I mean, today, you know, we, we don't sort of think of a, a small group of artists uh, sort of mounting their own exhibition as, as anything to um, dramatic or rebellious, but in 1908, uh, 
if you wanted to participate in the art world, there were uh, you had to you had to follow the the steps of going through the National Academy of Design. Uh, otherwise, you you basically had no other uh, options available to you. So this was a major turning point, um, if not in um, the sort of uh, nature of the works themselves that were being presented, even though the subject matter was somewhat new and, and more modern than, than its predecessors. Um, as we'll see when we look at some of the works in the Armory Show, uh, um, Andrea, I see you have a question. Was this model based on the French Academy? It absolutely was based on the French Academy. Um, it was based uh, probably more so on the Royal Academy of London, uh, which was slightly younger than the Académie des Beaux-Arts in, in France. Um, but it was uh, certainly based on the European notion of, of the Academy of Fine Arts. So yes, very good question. Marshall, I'd like to, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a quick sure, question as sure, well. Sure. And, and, and I don't want to get too meta about this and sort of take you off the the very appropriate and, and interesting line that you're on right now. But I, I'm curious as, you know, so you just walked us through, um, I don't know, probably 12 or 15 different uh, pieces of art. And, and I'm wondering if you step out of this just for a moment, from your perspective as a curator, as someone who works in a museum and has a lot of experience in this, how, how much does indiv how much do individual pieces um, change when put in the context of others? Does that make sense? So the, so the collection itself is sort of constructed in a way and that algorithm mm -hmm. of, of these 12, not those 12 were, or, or the way that they fit together must, must have some cumulative effect. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, context is, Everything. Uh, right, exactly. And and um, um, so yes, absolutely. I mean, the 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 meaning or the the optics through which you can see these works of art may change dramatically uh, based upon uh, the context that 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 they're shown in. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why the uh, Armory Show itself was so shocking to the American public is because they had very little context for it. Um, it was something that was entirely brand new for many of them. Um, I mean, the eight uh, and their exhibition in 1908 was rebellious on, on, on certainly it was rebellious in terms of reacting against um, the Academy, uh, but the works themselves were still very much indebted to European precedents. So uh, the shock factor wasn't nearly as great in 1908 as it would be in 1913. So another really, Andy, did you have another? Sorry. No, no I, I just want to say thank you for addressing that. I appreciate it. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so another really important um, uh, precursor uh, to the Armory Show, and really the, the group that was responsible for its organization was a group known as the Association of American Painters and Sculptors. And this was uh, uh, a, a small group of artists that was formed um, in 1912 in reaction to the National Academy. Uh, the, this group of artists felt that while the eight uh, sort of had laid a kind of foundation, they, they were not organized, uh, they weren't professionalized, or they weren't incorporated um, in, 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 in any way whatsoever. They were just a sort of loose association of, of artists. So the American Association of Painters and Sculptors got together uh, it was the brainchild of these four artists here, Elmer McRae, Henry Fitch Taylor, Walt Kuhn, and Jerome Myers. And I should say none of whom have really gone on to uh, ha or went on to have great careers in the art world, uh, with the exception perhaps of Walt Kuhn, who was maybe the best known of this four. But these artists felt that the Academy was too restrictive uh, they did not like the jury system. They didn't feel that it was democratic in any way. Um, 
and they wanted to form uh, an exhibiting society of their own that um, was much more open uh, uh, to newer styles and and was absent of prizes and juries that that the academy uh, uh, continued to to um, to have. Now the group uh, was. Uh, formed, ironically, very much on the model of the Academy. Uh, so, you know, they, they, these artists came together, uh, these four artists, and then they began inviting their friends to, to come and join the, the organization. And they elected a president, just like the National Academy of Design. Uh, their first president was uh, uh, an artist who was also had been a member of the eight, uh, Arthur B. Davies, who you see here. Now the the association, American Association of Painters and Sculptors, stated initially that their organization was for the purpose of developing a broad interest in American art activities by holding exhibitions of the best contemporary work that can be secured, representative of American and foreign art. So immediately out of the gate, these artists uh wanted to do two things that were very important they wanted to show uh younger american art contemporary american art that uh perhaps would not have um a chance to be shown at the the academy um, but they also wanted to embrace uh, international art or in this case it was limited to european art um, but still uh, looking uh, across the ocean and very much open to, to what was happening in Europe. The Armory Show. The Armory Show is really itself um, indebted to three primary organizers, that two of whom came out of the American Association of Painters and Sculptors. So right off the bat, the AAPS decided they wanted to have a big exhibition. They wanted to have an exhibition much larger than the eight had several years earlier, uh, and one that would even be larger than that of the Academy. The organization of the Armory Show is really fell on the shoulders of three men in particular. Arthur B. Davies, who at the time was the president of the AAPS, and in many ways was the one behind the scenes sort of pulling the strings. Uh, Walt Kuhn, uh, also one of the founding members of the AAPS, um, was uh, responsible, as we'll see, for many of the logistics. Walter Pock uh, was an American expatriate at that time living in Europe who enabled the two other organizers to really make this happen. Pock was himself an artist, uh, an art critic, uh, a lecturer, an art advisor, an art historian. Uh, he wrote extensively about modern art and was a great champion for modern art. Uh, this is one of his works from 1912. He is not very well known today as an artist. Uh, I wouldn't say that he necessarily went on to have a great career as an artist. Uh, and in fact, he's he's much better known today as um, one of the organizers of the Armory Show than he is uh, a visual artist in his own right. Walt Kuhn uh, followed a fairly conventional um, background. Um, and at the time uh, uh, leading up to the Armory Show, he was uh, working in a sort of quasi-impressionistic style um, and creating very conventional uh, landscapes like the one that we see here, uh, Ogonquit, Maine, from about 1910. Arthur B. Davies, uh, we saw um, one of his other works uh, in, in an earlier slide. Um, Davies is really a kind of unique uh, character. Uh, he, uh, even though he exhibited with the eight, he ended up becoming a member of the Academy uh, he never really was much, uh, he didn't fit into one category of the other. And primarily that was because of the works that, that he made. And, and this is probably a more 
um, uh, I would say representative example of his work than the earlier one I showed. It's a very fantastical uh, landscape with, with three unicorns and some maidens here in this sort of um, uh, uh, very sort of paradise-like landscape. And Alma, you have a question here. Was this group more accepted than the eight or was it seen as rebellious? It was more accepted than the eight. Uh, uh, I think probably because they were um, organizing themselves uh, very much on a similar principle to um, the academy. So they were trying to be much more sort of professional about it, if you will. Uh, they were interested in having a, 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 a constitution and having uh, rules and having a president and a vice president and a secretary and a treasurer. So they were really interested in, in um, trying to uh, work. Uh, I, even though they wanted to bring in modern art to this country, they, they were working in a very sort of conventional type of, of, of organization. We know, okay, let me see, there's another question here. Yes, um, we know that women were involved in organizing the Armory Show. Um, were works by any women artists exhibited? There were a few works uh, by women artists exhibited. Um, yes, very good question. Um, however, I would say that um, there was one very important woman who was involved, uh, at least uh, peripherally, in helping to organize the, the Armory Show. Um, and yes, the, it was typical of that time period. Uh, there, there were very few exhibiting opportunities for women uh, at the time. Uh, yes, absolutely, unfortunately. And, and very few opportunities uh, for art education for women at that time as well, even though at the National Academy they did have life classes for women. Um, but to make that leap from uh, the classroom to uh, the gallery was very, very difficult. Uh, but just to go back to the, the, the person I was speaking about uh, who was in some ways peripherally responsible or, or helpful at least in the organization of the Armory Show, that was an American expatriate and her partner, um, uh, Gertrude Stein, who lived in Paris, who was a great champion, champion of modern art and um, a host to Americans when they would come to Paris. So she was instrumental in, in working with a few of the organizers and connecting them with some of the artists in Paris. Uh, so, so she was certainly involved and, and did play, play a role. Okay, so there was a precedent for the Armory Show, a European precedent, and that was uh, the International Art Exhibition of the Federation of West German Art Lovers. That, believe me, that, that was the title of the exhibition, and if you think it's long in English, you should see it in German. It's about twice as long. This is a large exhibition that was held in 1912. Um, and according to the art, the Armory Show lore, uh, Davies uh, had gotten a, his hands on a copy of the catalog from this exhibition. This exhibition uh, really was groundbreaking uh, in Europe as well, even though many of these artists that were shown there had, had exhibited before. Uh, it was a show that included 173 artists and had, for example, 130 paintings by uh, Vincent van Gogh, uh, 26 paintings by Cezanne, and 25 by, by Paul Gauguin. So, so it, it was really a tremendous uh, presentation of modern art in, in Europe and um, served as the, the, the sort of foundation uh, or the basis for the Armory Show back in the States. Davies had a copy of the catalog he um, said to Kuhn, you must go and see this show. And he, he sent Kuhn over to, to Europe in, in uh, uh, I think it was in October of 1912. Kuhn apparently arrived uh, the 
day that the show was being taken down. He was able to see much of the show, uh, however, and it had a tremendous impact on him and actually uh, led him uh, to uh, really look at um, these artists and, and, and consider them for the Armory show the following year. And I'm showing you three examples here um, by um, Van Gogh, Cezanne, and Edvard Munch, uh, some of the examples of the works that were shown in, in the Cologne exhibition of 1912. So Walt Kuhn, after having seen the, um, the Cologne exhibition, um, uh, makes his way throughout Europe, uh, seeking out artists. He goes to The Hague, goes to Amsterdam, goes to Munich, and he ends up in Paris, really the center of the art world at that time. Um, Davies arrives not long after Kuhn is in Paris, and they meet up with uh, their friend, Walter Pock, uh, who had been living there for quite some time. And the three of them uh, go around the city, they're introduced to dealers, they're introduced to artists, and they begin to um, get commitments for uh, work, for loans, for their Armory Show exhibition. Meanwhile, back home, the AAPS is looking for a venue for their show. And they settle on uh, the 69th Regiment Armory in New York. Um, it is a large building uh, on Lexington Avenue and um, 25th Street. It's still there. You can see it uh, in 1913 on the left and today um, on the right. They um, secured this building for the amazing sum of $5,000, which, as you can imagine, in 1913 was uh, an incredible amount of money. And, you know, throughout my studies of the Armory Show, one of the things that continually sort of surprises me is how they were able to pull off these logistics, because this was a, a fairly new organization, the AAPS. Um, you know, it was, uh, even though they were trying to be organized and professionalized, uh, they were essentially a, a, a sort of small band of artists. Um, and to be able to scrape together the amount of money to secure the venue was, was really in itself uh, a challenge um, uh, that was really kind of incredible. Here we see a copy of the program for the exhibition. Uh, technically, the title of the, the exhibition was the International Exhibition of Modern Art. And you can see beneath that Association of American Painters and Sculptors, uh, the 69th Infantry Regiment Armory in New York City. It was on view from February 15th to March 15th, 1913. One month. It was one month that it was on view, which today seems short for an exhibition. And certainly uh, for a show that included over 1,300 works of art, it was an uh, astonishingly short period of time. The association took for the symbol of the Armory Show this stylized pine tree that you can see here on the cover of the program. And that has significance. Uh, the, uh, the artist took it from one of the American revolutionary flags. And so in a sense, um, they're sort of uh, stating uh, symbolically here through the use of this uh, appropriated image, shall we say, um, just how sort of revolutionary, revolutionary they were. This was the entrance to the, to the Armory Hall here. And you can see uh, the galleries in the distance. They were decorated with garlands. Um, and, and we'll walk through these galleries um, um, in, the, in the following slides. I see Laura is typing. I, I wonder if, uh, here we go. Can you talk a bit about the other sites of the show in Chicago and Boston? I never knew about those until I did the reading for this webinar. I will, um, I'll touch on those at the end, Laura. 
Um, yes, uh, the, the Armory show uh, was not only in New York City, but it did travel uh, to two other cities uh, in this country. So here's a uh, plan of the, the exhibition that you can see here. Um, there were 18 galleries of art. Uh, and basically on the right hand side uh, was the American paintings and sculpture and drawings. Uh, the central galleries housed mostly modern and historic European works. And on the left hand side were a mixture of American and European works. So the visitor would enter into entrance, the entrance hall, gallery A. And the thinking was that the circulation would follow uh, by going to the right and beginning with the American galleries, heading through the American galleries, then entering into the modern and historic European works, sort of doubling back, going through hall A once again, and then leading through the European and the American works mixed, mixed together and culminating with uh, Gallery I, which was uh, by far the best known gallery in the exhibition, also called the Cubist Room. So when the visitor entered into the exhibition, he or she first saw Gallery A which was comprised exclusively of American art. And this was not coincidental. The AAPS uh, wanted the visitor to enter in and first see American art. Andy, did you have a question? No, no, Marshall, thank you. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, it was uh, included works such as this, George Gray Barnard's Prodigal Son from 1904. Um, but if you recall, um, and th this is something perhaps to keep in the back of your mind as we look at some of these works, is that uh, if you recall, I mentioned how many of the works by uh, the eight, Robert Henry, George Lukes, Everett Shin, and that group were, even though breaking with tradition, they were still very much indebted to European precedents. And it's something that, that you should keep in your mind as we go through and look at these works, especially with a work like this by George Gray Barnard, uh, sculptor. Prodigal Son is, as you can see, uh, uh, it, it undeniably indebted to, to Auguste Rodin, the great French sculptor who in the early 20th century uh, really was probably at the peak of his um, fame. Gallery A was also decorated with uh, a whole series of these sort of Asian inspired uh, screens by Robert Winthrop Chandler, uh, an artist who today is completely unknown whatsoever. And then the visitor would, would make a right and enter into the galleries of, a main, of American painting and sculpture. And now these galleries were filled with um, primarily conventional work, even to the point of it perhaps seeming somewhat retrograde. Um, American Impressionism, uh, even in the first decade of the 20th century, uh, was something, a style that was still very popular. It was shown at the National Academy, and even the artists of the eight uh, couldn't help but show uh, glimpses of, of impressionistic technique. Um, yes, very much like Monet. This is Elmer McRae's Battleships from 1912. Um, Child Hassam, uh, probably the best known or certainly one of the best known American impressionists. Uh, he was represented by uh, several works in the Armory Show, uh, mostly European works. This is uh, uh, his landscape showing Vesuvius in the background. And here, uh, his Spanish steps in Rome. J. Alden Weir, another sort of 
um, senior member of American Impressionism, if you will. And, and ironically, Weir, uh, Weir's name had been co-opted by the AAPS early on, and he was, uh, at the formation of the group, elected president in absentia, uh, learning of this only through reading about it in the newspaper the following evening, um, uh, which infuriated him and led him to uh, contact the group immediately and tell them that, that he would have nothing uh, whatsoever to do with them. Although I assume when it came time to exhibit in the Armory show and he was extended an invitation, he gladly uh, accepted. Ernest Lawson, a member of the eight, an original member of the eight, was one of the exhibitors in 1908, um, uh, but still very much indebted to European precedents, uh, in particular Impressionism. And we can think of, especially with this work, those snow scenes by, uh, by Claude Monet. George Bellows, who was not a member of the eight, but very much connected to Robert Henry, um, Ernest Lawson, um, uh, younger than many of those artists, did not exhibit with them in 1908, um, but he was sort of taken in by the group. Um, and we can see here that, that modern subject, it's a contemporary subject, it's not an impressionist landscape. So modern in a sense, verging towards modernism, um, but as we'll see, not nearly as sort of daring or innovative as some of the European works. John Sloan's McSorley's Bar, a typical Ashcan school painting of, uh, of a famous New York bar that's still in operation today. And then Robert Henry's contributions to the Armory Show. Uh, two figure paintings uh, on the right, a Spanish gypsy, uh, and on the left, uh, a, a, a full length nude called Figure in Motion, 1913. Walt Kuhn's submission to the Armory Show was somewhat more adventurous than that earlier Impressionist painting we saw by him. Certainly, he must have been influenced by, uh, by his, uh, his recent interactions with modern art. And we see here his morning, uh, still a landscape, still could be sort of uh, considered um, connected to Impressionism and the way in which he's these striated brushstrokes uh, are used to render the light in the background, uh, but certainly something of a departure from his earlier paintings. Edward Hopper was an exhibitor in the Armory Show. Uh, he was quite young at the time, and he showed this, this single painting, Sailing, um, from 1912-1913, now in the collection of the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. There were some American modern artists uh, who exhibited in the Armory Show. There weren't many, um, but there were some, and Charles Sheeler being one of them with his Mandarin of 1912, a still life, uh, a fairly conventional subject, but the way in which he's rendered his subject um, is very modern indeed. Uh, the sort of loose modeling, uh, the brushy application of paint, and the, um, uh, the sort of, uh, it lacks the kind of fussiness or attention to, to perspectival accuracy that, that, uh, that some of the academic works had. John Marin is another uh, sort of uh, progressive uh, or, or, or innovative American artist who showed in the exhibition um, with a whole series of, of watercolors, uh, these, including these two, uh, showing views of the Woolworth Building from 1912. The Woolworth Building had just been built, and it was at the time the tallest uh, building, uh, certainly in New York. I think it may have been the tallest building in the world at the time. Um, so it was a technological achievement, and Marin is rendering it here uh, using this faceted uh, brushstrokes of, of modern art, uh, not, not rendering it in a kind of academic uh, way with uh, 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 indebted to perspectival accuracy. Morton Schamberg, another modern artist who exhibited in the, in the Armory Show, uh, another American who was very progressive at the time. 
sculpture uh, was represented primarily by works like we saw with George Gray Barnard's um, uh, sort of quasi-academic work. But there were some modern artists as well. Ellie Nadelman was one. And you can see he creates these sort of sinuous, elongated uh, figures that are very stylized that, you know, at once seem kind of reductive in nature uh, and, and, and are modern in that regard, but also harken back to antiquity and can be seen to be reminiscent of, let's say, Greek and Roman sculpture. And Guy Pendubois, uh, another uh, artist who was also an art critic and a champion of modern art, uh, depicting uh, a very contemporary scene of this couple uh, at an outdoor restaurant. And Christy said, Hopper's piece seemed more structured there than, than others. Yeah, you know, Hopper actually had been in Europe in the uh, years preceding the Armory show. Um, and his early work is very much indebted to uh, the Ashcan school. Um, and you can even see a little bit of that in that sailing picture, even though his palette is much lighter. Um, he doesn't really begin to work in the mature style that we know of today until about the 1920s or so, or late 19 teens. So he was really, uh, it was a bit of a transitional phase, I would say, for him. So one thing that, that the AAPS really wanted to try and do with the Armory Show was to put the modern European works into a uh, context. And they wanted to show this by, by linking them to some of the great 19th century works that had preceded them. So there was an entire section of the Armory Show dedicated to historic European works. It included works such as this by uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Camille Corot, who was one of the great 19th, mid 19th century landscape painters and had a tremendous influence on um, uh, the Barbizon school and the Impressionists uh, and, and beyond. And Corot really kind of uh, was innovative because he had sort of one foot in the academic camp and one foot in the, in the sort of avant-garde or progressive camp. The historic European section included this work by Honoré Daumier, uh, third class carriage from 1856 uh, and, and later. And this work, um, Daumier was important because he was an illustrator in the 19th century and really was not, um, he, he didn't, he wasn't required to depict high minded subject matter. And so he was free to depict uh, classes and types um, across the board. So he was really one of the first artists to, to, to get, um, get a tremendous amount of attention for doing that. Edgar Degas, uh, certainly one of the, the better known impressionists. Uh, this, this painting, Racehorses, was included in the Armory Show, now in the Detroit Institute. Eugène Delacroix, one of the great uh, romantic painters of the 19th century. Uh, also a great influence on the Barbizon school uh, later on, and also even uh, for the Impressionists uh, following on the Barbizon school. Edward Manet, perhaps the single most important artist for the Impressionists with his bullfight of 1865. And of course, a, a, a small selection of Impressionist work as well, including these two works, uh, one on the left, very famous, uh, Claude Monet, the beach at Trouville, 1870, and on the right, his uh, Cliffs at Etretat, a, a subject to which he returned many, many times during his career. One artist who was also included in the historic section was really interesting, uh, Pierre Pruvide de Chavennes. Uh, Chavin, Pouvier de Chavin was a, a, a had, again, he sort of was one of those artists who had one foot in the academic camp and one foot in, in the sort of progressive camp, but he was known for, for large-scale mural paintings 
that had a didactic theme to them. And, and religious subjects uh, were fairly common in his work. And, and here you see, uh, this was uh, one of uh, Puvita Chavin's works included in the Armory Show, The Beheading of St. John the Baptist. Post-Impressionism was also very much important in the Armory Show. And I would say that um, the post-Impressionist works were um, at this point uh, uh, not brand new. They, they couldn't uh, be considered contemporary uh, in the true sense of the term. Um, but uh, they were a small, I expect that would be an interesting thing to know. They tended, the, the size of the works tended to be honest. Uh, uh, they certainly weren't what we would call salon style paintings, uh, large scale. Um, uh, I didn't include, you know, that was one thing I, I wondered about including was dimensions for works, but I, I chose not to do, to include dimensions on these slides because I didn't want the slides themselves to become so full of text. Um, but works like this, this one here by, by Cezanne uh, were fairly modest in nature. Uh, I would refer to them as um, sort of parlor size pictures, if that, if that helps. Um, yeah, and, and actually, Marshall, I might ask you to expand on that a little bit. Dave is, is actually uh, thinking along the same lines. You know, when we put this PowerPoint together, we were struggling a little bit with the way that we are representing the scale and the size. Um, can you comment at all to the mm -hmm. physical size of any of these, uh, of these pieces and, and the way that that may or may not change uh, the way we view them? I would say that, um, you know, works like the Paul Cezanne here would probably be about the size of your window, let's say. So, you know, um, not not small by any sense of, 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 of that, that term, but uh, certainly not uh, the type of grand manor paintings that, that uh, we would have seen in the 19th century, for example. So if that's helpful, um, uh, let me know if, if you if you'd like me to expound on that a little bit, I can I can do that as well. Um, there were also many drawings and prints included in the in the armory show, and those tended to be quite a bit smaller um, in size, you know, sort of uh, eight by 10 or 11 by 14 uh, uh, type type size. Um, but just to go back uh, to what I was saying before, um, post-impressionism was a, a very important component of the Armory show uh, for several reasons. Um, and when I say post-impressionism, uh, what I mean is not necessarily a, a stylist, a style or a movement, but a kind of um, simply, a, it's a chronological term to denote um, artists who sort of came up after the Impressionist generation and the works that followed really beginning in the in the kind of 1880s and 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 into the early 20th century. Um, I see there's a comment here about Barnes and Glackens. Yeah, there was a lot of money in 19 in 1913 for an artwork to comparison to Dr. Barnes. Yeah, yeah. So so this Paul Cezanne painting here was uh, the most expensive work in the Armory Show at $48,600. Um, incredibly uh, expensive uh, at the time. Uh, and uh, it, it was not purchased uh, at the time of the Armory Show. It, it, it did not sell, um, but now it's in the collection of the National Gallery of London, as you can see. Um, many of the works, if not most of the works, were, were for sale during the Armory Show. And in fact, there was a whole team of, of uh, representatives, shall we say, uh, who were handling sales. This is another Paul Cezanne painting that was included in the Armory Show. Uh, and it was the most expensive work purchased at the Armory Show. And it was $6,700. Um, it's now in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. And the first Cezanne to enter into an American museum's collection so that's actually a really important point because, um, uh, and it's one of the other things that I was going to say as far as uh, the importance of the representation of post-impressionism in the Armory show, is that it really 
um, exposed this work not only to the general public, but also to um, the museums, the institutions at that time. And so it helped uh, plant the seed to build these collections, these future collections at American museums. And certainly the Metropolitan Museum today has one of the great collections of, of Impressionism and Post-Impressionism. By the way, Marshall, again. Marshall, I'm going to use yeah. this time too to remind us that we're at eight o'clock uh, East Coast time, so we're about two thirds of the way through tonight's webinar. Just to give yourself um, a way to pace, we've got probably twenty to twenty-five more minutes. Okay, great, great, great. Um, Paul Gauguin was another very important post-impressionist uh, slash symbolist artist included in the exhibition, represented by eight paintings, three watercolors. Uh, one drawing a sculpture and several prints. Uh, this is a large painting of uh, Fa Iehe from 1898, uh, painted after the artist moved to Tahiti. This is another Paul Gauguin painting that he did uh, after he moved to Tahiti. He really sort of um, uh, disavowed uh, Parisian life and gave up his job as a stockbroker, as a matter of fact, and uh, to move to the South Seas. Van Gogh was represented by 17 oils in one drawing, including this one here, Dance Hall at Arles, from 1888. And keep in mind, you know, for the general public, this was the first time they were getting a look at this work, even though, you know, th these paintings uh, at this point are, are, you know, 15, 20 years old. They're not brand new. But work like this had never really been seen before uh, in the U.S. Another Van Gogh landscape here, the mountains at Saint-Rémy, now in the collection of the Guggenheim Museum, uh, although they wouldn't have purchased it from the Armory Show. Another Van Gogh, uh, Le Zouave uh, from 1888, a uh, wonderful drawing that's now in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. And Edvard Munch, best known for uh, his painting The Scream, which unfortunately was not included in the Armory show, but he had a, a whole series of prints that were included, including the three we see here, a vampire on the left, uh, the Madonna on the, in the middle there, and Moonlight on the, on the far right. Now, the European moderns probably made the greatest impact on the American public out of any other work in the exhibition. This, uh, these were shown in several galleries throughout the, the, the exhibition space, uh, the largest of which was Gallery H that you see here. Henri Matisse probably was, uh, after Marcel Duchamp, uh, one of the artists who made the biggest impact uh, amongst the public and the critics. Um, and Matisse, uh, again, keep in mind, this is really the first time that Matisse's work um, was being shown uh, to, the, to, the public, to the U.S. public, and he was represented by 13 paintings, two drawings, and one sculpture in the exhibition. So there were a number of works by him in the show, and, and this painting, actually, to go back to the question of size, this painting is quite large. I, I don't know the exact measurements off the top of my head, but it's probably about eight feet tall, I would say. Let's see, and I see there's a comment here. I was always curious how they kept the, the paintings safe as well as given the lack of modern security and technology. Um, and Alice, what would a piece like this cost today? Hmm, well, okay, I'll start uh, with the first comment. Um, as far as security, they must have had some sort of security uh, um, or, or police presence at the, at the armory show. But keep in mind, it was also an armory so it was, uh, uh, by its very nature, a kind of fortress, uh, and, and thereby, I would imagine, difficult to, to, to breach the security. Um, as far as the cost of a piece like this today, um, I don't know what these large Matisses are going for at auction, but um, uh, in the many millions of dollars, for sure. Probably Matisse's most sort of scandalous work at the Armory Show was his large and very famous blue nude from 1907. Uh, really what was shocking to the general public uh, most and the critics that wrote about the Armory show was Matisse's 
audacious use of color. Matisse in the early in the early 20th century uh, was the leader of a movement called Fauvism uh, that was a, a, a translates to wild beast and he was part of a group of artists who um, broke from the academic tradition and used color in such a way um, that really elicited a kind of emotive reaction from the viewer. And certainly for many, uh, that was negative, <laughs> at least when it was shown here in the US. His Red Studio from 1911, again, this audacious use of color, uh, this lack of sort of uh, adherence to per perspectival um, accuracy, a very flat in nature. And if you look in the in the upper right there of this painting, you will see a very small rendering of his painting, Le Lux, which we just saw several slides earlier. Another wonderful uh, painting by Matisse, a goldfish and sculpture from 1912. The red headdress, again, audacious use of color, very little modeling in the figure, uh, very little sort of attention to, to true anatomical accuracy, uh, really more of an interest in, in capturing uh, um, uh, a sort of uh, emotion or, or moment than, than trying to, to accurately represent the figure. Konstantin Brancusi was a sculptor included in, in the exhibition who was uh, probably equally, if not more, sort of shocking to the general public. Um, these were two works that were selected by, by Pac and Davies and Kuhn. Uh, they had gone to Brancusi's studio in Paris and, and hand-selected these works. The Kiss on the left, 1907-08, and Torso d'une femme, or, or a woman's torso from 1912. And then really kind of scandalous, to the American public were these two works uh, by Brancusi. Uh, Mademoiselle Pagani, uh, number one from 1912 on the left and Sleeping Muse from 1911 on the right. Um, again, a sort of interest in reducing the, the, the facial features and, or the elements of the figure down into their most uh, elemental state and stylizing the eyes and the nose uh, to the point of, of, of true abstraction, uh, which you know was for many uh, somewhat of a difficult pill to swallow. Kandinsky was included in the exhibition, the great Russian uh, born artist who was working in Germany at the time with this painting. Uh, he only had one painting in the show. Andre Duran, another Fauvist artist. Pablo Picasso, probably the best known uh, artist of the 20th century, was included with uh, five paintings, a, a gouache, which is a, a water-based painting, a drawing and one sculpture, including this early work from Picasso's blue period, uh, Madame Soleil from 1903. Now, finally, uh, really the culmination of the exhibition was Gallery I, also known as the Cubist Gallery, or in the press, the Chamber of Horrors. Here's a, a very rare newspaper clipping showing a, a photograph of that gallery. This is the only documentation of the gallery that we have today. But you can see in this clipping uh, the painting by Albert Glez on the left, Man on a Balcony from 1912. And really the most shocking thing about this gallery and these works uh, was that uh, they seemed to eschew all of the rules that had preceded uh, the works of art um, before them and threw them out the window. And it's true, cubism, and what I'm showing you now is not a mistake, um, cubism was a movement that came out of uh, artists' interest in technology, and the changing world in the early 20th century. Uh, keep in mind, in the first decade of the 20th century, um, the automobile became, um, uh, I, I don't want to say common, but uh, developed to the point where um, it wasn't a brand new technology anymore. Uh, travel was uh, changed forever because of that. 
um, uh, flight occurred uh, not long after uh, that. And so technology was, was coming along in leaps and bounds. And the, the really progressive and avant-garde artists reflected that. And so for the previous 500 years leading up to the first decade of the 20th century, artists were after realistic accuracy, perspectival accuracy. That was the great achievement of the Renaissance. It really epitomized here by this 16th century painting. And I'll show you in just a second exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, one point perspectival, uh, one point perspective was developed uh, in the 16th century. And what that means is that all of the orthogonals or all of the receding lines of the painting all join at one point on the horizon. And we can see that here if we look at this diagram of the paint of this Renaissance painting. So cubism completely explodes that notion, as you can see here. And what the cubist artists were after were representing multiple viewpoints of a single object simultaneously. So different um, planes of the same physical object, whether it be a violin or a, a person or a building, and representing the back and the front and the sides simultaneously on a two-dimensional surface. Picasso's Woman with a Mustard Pot, a very famous cubist work. One of Picasso's sculptures, now at the Art Institute of Chicago. One of his drawings, now at the Metropolitan Museum. And then Francis Picabia, uh, Dances at Spring, a sort of quasi-cubist work. I'm going to speed up a little bit here because I see our time ticking away. And then finally, the Duchamp brothers. They were uh, probably became the most infamous uh, group of artists who exhibited in the Armory Show. It was three brothers, they each had different last names, and that was by design. Uh, Raymond, Raymond Duchamp Villon, who was a sculptor primarily, showed these works in the Armory Show. Jacques Villon showed this work here, Girl at Piano, as well as this here, this one here, Young Girl. And then Marcel Duchamp, the youngest of the brothers and the most uh, innovative and uh, avant-garde of the three. And this painting in particular was um, this star attraction for the Armory Show. It was Marcel Duchamp's Nude Descending a Staircase. Again, a fairly modest size painting. Oh, I see there's a question here. Let me see, let me see. Putting, let's see. Where would one go to see the effect of the war to end all wars on these armory show artists? Is there a single show collection? Um, well, there's been there's been quite a bit of uh, scholarly writing on uh, the Cubist uh, connection with the development of technology. I would say um, World War One probably had a greater impact on the next generation of artists that followed. And so if you're interested in, in that, um, the, the, the Dada artists, the artists known as Dada, D-A-D-A, -D -A, uh, which was a, a group uh, that really came out of the, the, the destruction of World War I, um, and of which Marcel Duchamp became an important part later on, uh, was, 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 um, was, was part of that. So this painting uh, really caused an incredible sensation. Um, they, uh, the press had a field day with this, as you can imagine. Nude descending a staircase. They couldn't understand it. They didn't know what it was. People couldn't make out the figure in the painting. Um, but the, the work itself actually has uh, roots that are, that are um, uh, fairly identifiable in photography. And we can see in the late 19th century, there are many photographers working with studies of motion. And so Duchamp actually uh, admitted later on in life that he was very much inspired by these motion studies that he had seen. So there was even a, a, a contest that was um, offered by one of the newspapers in New York to try to find the nude in the painting um, and come up with uh, a poem in order to 
find the nude. And this is one of my favorite ones here. You've tried to find her and you've looked in vain, up the picture and down again. You've tried to fashion her broken bits. And you've worked yourself into 17 fits. The reason you failed to tell you I can, it isn't a lady, but only a man. So the responses to the Armory show and its legacy are really incredible. Uh, the press had, as I said, a complete field day with this. The cartoons lambasting some of the works in the show are, in some cases, more interesting or at least more amusing than the works themselves. Let's see, I, I see there was a, there's a, wasn't there a parody called Staircase Descending, Sending a Nude? Yes, and you can see the motion in the bottom half the pain by the legs. Yes, yes, all very good comments. And we'll see a couple of these uh, here. So this this is one of the one of the um, one of the cartoons uh, that that really made fun of the armory show. And you can see it Brancusi sculptures here. Uh, this is John Marin's uh, Woolworth building. This is Picabia's painting uh, here, Walt Kuhn's painting here. And of course, New Descending a Staircase is here. It's a portrait of a lady going up a staircase. This is a wonderful, uh, and again, a very famous cartoon uh, lampooning uh, Duchamp's painting, The Rude Descending a Staircase Rush Hour at the Subway. And then two of my favorites that uh, aren't nearly as well known. Uh, on the left, a futurist home run. Um, and on the right, the original cubist, a quilter, uh, and she's saying, I took the first prize at the fair last fall. Nobody who has been drinking is let in to see this show. Again, uh, direct quotations from the works themselves. A near post-impression of a post-impressionist room at the International Exhibition. And just to go back for a, a couple slides to show you how indebted the American works were to European precedents. We saw this Elmer McRae on the left earlier, uh, clearly based on uh, Renoir's Luncheon of the Boating Party, very famous painting from the 1880s, 30 years uh, prior. Uh, Everett Shin, we saw this, at the, the exhibition of the eight, based very much on Edgar Degas' work from the 1870s. Even Morton Schomburg's uh, sort of progressive for an American study of a girl in 1912, um, undeniably indebted to Henri Matisse. And then Marcel Duchamp's New Descending a Staircase. And this, this juxtaposition here, I think, really summarizes uh, the Armory show in many, many ways because it shows two full-length figures, two full-length nude figures, both in motion, one by Marcel Duchamp, one by Robert Henry, a leader of the eight, but clearly done in a very different conservative uh, and um, realistic way, as opposed to Duchamp's painting. Now, what was the effect on the three organizers? To conclude, Walter Pock went from painting like this to painting like this, just several, just two years later, Walt Kuhn, who had earlier done these Impressionist paintings, actually turned to circus subject matter. And Arthur Davies, who had done these fantastical landscapes, ended up painting these faceted figures, entirely indebted to somebody like Picabia. Morton Schomburg, indebted to Matisse, eventually verged toward abstraction and then even used what we call ready-mades, like this one from 1917. And then finally, in 1998, the Armory Show was commemorate, commemorated by the U.S. Postal Service with this wonderful stamp, with this couple clearly not uh, uh, convinced by Duchamp's new Descending a Staircase, looking at it uh, inquisitively, to say the least. So um, with that, I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to start with one question for you, Marshall. Um, and that is, you know, all, all of the folks in our webinar tonight, as, as you walk through this, you may have seen that the chatter was in, in oftentimes regards to the, to the pieces of art and you know, the, the beauty, the, the symmetry, the way that they were presented. 
But but all these folks are going to stand in front of kids tomorrow. They're going to stand in front of younger students, and they're going to consider ways to, um, you know, to share and to showcase uh, this kind of story with them. Do you have any mm -hmm. advice mm -hmm. as as an artist, as a museum curator? Do you have any advice on the best approaches? Not not for teaching, not for being in a classroom, but just in terms of describing and and inviting a um, a novice to look at this. Are, are there any sort of key mm -hmm. questions that you use? when you approach any piece of art like this? Sure, um, and Laura, I did see your, your question again, and I will um, mention the other, the, other, um, the other venues for sure. Um, I would say that, you know, uh, one of the, the, the important things to keep in mind um, and is that, you know, the, the communication that um, occurred in 1913 um, wasn't like, as you all know, wasn't like the communication that we have today. So, so sources of information were not readily available on modern or contemporary art, certainly as far as what was going on in Europe. So, I mean, I would say um, that, you know, it was, it, it, it was a, a moment of um, significant aesthetic realization for uh, hundreds of thousands of people, um, some of whom came and saw the Armory show in person, for sure, um, but, uh, but also those who read about it in the press, who maybe didn't even come and see the show, who maybe only saw these uh, satirical cartoons, um, but they still would have uh, taken away from that, that this was uh, something that was revolutionary on some level, whether they uh, liked it or not. Um, um, so I think, I think that's really important to keep in mind. Um, and to speak a little bit about the other venues, um, so the Armory show was seen by, in New York, by about 90,000 people, which is a lot, uh, certainly for an exhibition that was only up for a month, um, and in that day. Um, it closed uh, in mid-March, and within, I think it was two weeks or something, it was installed at the Art Institute of Chicago. The AAPS had negotiated with the Art Institute to take the show there, and the director of the Art Institute um, was keen on having it. Um, and it faced, uh, e and even though it was seen by more people in Chicago, I think the attendance in Chicago was close to 200,000 people. Um, it was even, um, it was received even less uh, warmly in Chicago, especially by the students at the Art Institute, which is kind of ironic because, um, you know, in art school, typically it's the students who are the ones who are sort of pushing the envelope and wanting to do something that's innovative and groundbreaking. But um, just to, to, uh, to qualify that with a, a, a humorous anecdote, um, the students were so incensed by Henri Matisse's use of color, his lack of modeling, that works like the blue nude, that they actually created an effigy of him uh, that they called Henry Mattress uh, and burned his effigy uh, as well as burned uh, um, uh, reproductions of his paintings that they had made uh, outside of the Art Institute. So this really fired up the students. I mean, it's kind of amusing to think, uh, you know, think of this today as it having such a, a sort of um, impact on the, on, the, on the students at that time, but it did. After it closed in Chicago, it moved on to Boston, and it was shown by many fewer people. I think the attendance in Boston was something like 15,000. I think the novelty had worn off. Uh, the, you know, the folks in Chicago had heard about it in New York and they wanted, they were sort of clamoring to see what all the fuss was about. Um, the show was diminished in size significantly with each successive venue. So I think by the time it got to Boston, it was quite a, quite a, different, um, a different show. Um, so yes. Uh, and let's see, there's another uh, question or comment here. Could you comment on Teddy Roosevelt's famous comments about the exhibit and how it may have shaped public opinion? Um, 
You know, that's a very good question. Um, Ro Teddy Roosevelt did see the show. Um, I'm looking to see. I don't think I have his actual comments here, but they were uh, they were negative uh, without being. Um, they weren't. If I recall, they weren't to the point of um, uh, of of completely dismissing the work. Um, I think uh, for Roosevelt, it was difficult for him to sort of understand it, uh, but. And, and it was reproduced in the newspaper. I do recall uh, seeing that, but, but I'm not sure if that had any effect one way or the other. I mean, usually the way that, you know, negative criticism works with an art exhibition is that people respond more to the negative uh, uh, criticism in terms of being curious about the actual exhibition and wanting to go see it. Um, but yes, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was one of the sort of uh, celebrity attendees, uh, if you will. Thank you. I hope you have a chance uh, tonight, Marshall, to scroll back through some of the comments that folks are making about the inspiration that they're taking from tonight's session and the way that it's really going to be, it's a powerful um, sort of refresher for teachers who then go and work with students to understand expression and, and the ways that art can play that role. I, I'd like to wrap tonight, tonight up and please, uh, to, to our audience, please continue to, to chime in. Uh, Marshall, I'm going to put you on the spot just a little bit, um, and I'm going to refer sure. back to our, our Humanities Moments campaign that I mentioned at the very beginning. And it's this, this notion that we all have, um, we have uh, artifacts or we have pieces of art or we have experiences that really sort of help us see the way that the humanities um, can help us better understand the world. So I, I wonder, you've talked several times tonight about your favorite or pieces that you speak about with, with a lot of knowledge and a lot of background. Um, I, I wonder in your own, your own personal, I mean this in a very first person way, in your own personal experience, what, what piece of art really spoke to you? What, what put you on this path that you would be here tonight with, uh, with this wealth of information? Um, is, there a, is there a particular artist or piece of art that sort of triggered that for you? It was your pivot? You know, I, I don't think I can um, identify one specific work of art that that did it for me, but I would say that I studied art history um, because of its interdisciplinary nature and, and, and the way in which, as an art historian, and when you teach art history, um, you can bring in all of the disciplines from economics and, and, and um, in industry and technology and, and religion, um, is that art reflects, reflects a change in humanity and it reflects uh, uh, these, these, like the Armory Show, for example, is a perfect example of how, um, you know, works like Marcel Duchamp's painting uh, reflect this moment in uh, in history when humanity sees the world in a new way. You know, Robert Hughes, uh, the art historian and art critic, uh, wrote this wonderful essay called The Shock of the New, in which he talks about how the moment that people could ascend to the top of the Eiffel Tower in the 1880s for the first time and be up high, 900 feet above the, the Earth's surface, that Humanity actually saw in a new way beginning at that moment. Um, it's the same way when uh, flight occurred um, and, and became popularized. So it's really those moments, those changing moments in humanity when, when we collectively uh, begin to see anew that, 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 that is the reason why I do what I do. Uh, that's a wonderful end to our webinar. Marshall, thank you so much for your insights and for joining us tonight. I'm going to ask everybody who's with us tonight to uh, to make sure you shake Marshall's hand, give him a high five, uh, applaud him as loud as you can wherever you might sit. Um, again, tonight's session is has been recorded and it will be archived and available to you probably within 24 hours. Uh, the associated um, PowerPoint will be there as well. So Marshall, thank you again. Um, I'll see you when I get back to North Carolina, I hope. Thank you. Thank you all. I want to remind everyone that there are numerous ways you can follow uh, the American class work that we do and the National Humanities Center in general. 
Uh, we do utilize uh, social media in a lot of ways. We have a Pinterest page. We have an Instagram page that is guest hosted by our teacher advisory council each month. And we have an active Facebook page. And you can pay attention to not only all of our online activities, but our face-to-face -face consultancy uh, opportunity as well. And I would like to invite you to join us next Thursday, February 16th, for the hidden photographs of the civil rights movement. Um, if that uh, topic is appealing to you, please sign up and join us. Please also share it with your school, with your colleagues, and with your friends. Thanks again, everyone. Be sure to go and fill out the evaluation so you can download your certification. And have a wonderful evening. Good night.